we start on time. Show so time. Thank you guys for um, coming. This is the WPA, <clears throat> Public WPA Art Tour. Um, Carolyn Milligan and Martin Link are going to be your tour guides today. I'm Rose Easton. I'm the Executive Director of Gallup Arts. And I'm just here to welcome you all and explain a little bit about where we're going to be going so that you have a, you can prepare yourself for the tour. Um, so this tour is part of our grant that, from the National Endowment for the Humanities to design a virtual art exhibit showcasing Gallup and McKinley County's WPA art. So we did a tour of the uh, works in the library. Today's tour is all about the works uh, in the county and the county uh, courthouse itself. And then on Thursday, there's another tour that I will be leading on Native Artists in the WPA, which is a combination of works in the library and works here uh, at the county courthouse. Um, and then there's one housekeeping thing. I do have a survey if you weren't on the last tour, if you wouldn't mind filling it out. It's helping us gather information about what you guys want to know and what excites you about the WPA, and that will inform the design of the virtual art exhibit. Um, so that it, it, we can dig up some information, more information about things that you're particularly interested in, or we can have your questions in mind as we're designing that exhibit. So I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn and Martin. The first half of the tour is around the exterior of the courthouse, the old courthouse, looking at the architecture. And then we're going to head inside and look at the amazing mural in the um, courtroom in the old courthouse. And I think we'll enter in through the south side so we don't have to go through security. I don't think you can get, can did we get they, to did, they, did you make arrangements no, we for didn't. them to open that door? We have door? to enter through this building. Oh, really? No, I yeah, didn't. Yeah, that's an alarm door. So you well, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> we better it stick to the... the, <laughs> to go the <clears throat> We're going through security. We'll have to come back here and go up this way. <laughs> that's that's oh, a I new... I don't even think I have enough uh, <laughs> Okay. Well, just a... a a brief um, summary about who's your tour guide and what does she know and when did she learn it. And um, I've lived in Gallup now for over 30 years. The WPA art was always a curiosity to me because there was no, no information about it. It was scattered. You didn't know exactly what it was and, and now it, it's becoming more well known and um, actually Gallup being a federal art center one of four in the state of New Mexico has probably the largest extant WPA collection in the state and um, and again that's pretty remarkable knowing that um, it's not a collection in, united in one place, and there is no staff, but it's managed to, especially the county's collection, is um, all where it was 13 years ago when we installed it. That's nice to know. Okay, so I'm ready to start, and you folks follow me, and, and I will point out what is unique about this courthouse, and Elmo Baca, I'm sure some of you know Elmo um, or know of him. He's with Historic Preservation. He's also an architect. And um, he thinks our courthouse is probably the finest courthouse in the state. And I'd have to agree with him. It's pretty spectacular. OK, let's take a walk. So let's stand in front of the, the primary entrance to the courthouse, but stand far enough back so that you can see the unique architectural features of this um, primary facade. And I'll tell you a little bit about the architect. Uh, the architect was Henry... Maybe, wait, maybe wait till everyone's Oh, there. okay. Yeah. 
and then Slow do you want to face them so they can hear you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and one unique thing, um, you see there's been some damage done, probably uh, has something to do with our high winds this spring and winter. Um, that what has been revealed is probably the original color of the courthouse. And, um, but I doubt that anyone's going to stucco it <laughs> that color in the future. But now we, we see what it might have looked like way back. But now let's go back to Henry Troost. Um, he was a student of um, a very famous Chicago architect, Sullivan, and he was also um, a, enrolled in, in Chicago working with Sullivan when Frank Lloyd Wright was there. And you can see clues to Frank Lloyd Wright in this primary facade. And um, <clears throat> one is these two um, reliefs on either side of the main entrance that are inspired by Native American images as well. And it's clouds at the top and then the vertical columns, um, the shadows on those columns form rain. So that seems an appropriate metaphor for living in the dry desert. <clears throat> um, there's also, you see these lights uh, flanking the main entrance, and you will notice the same lights around the three sides of the building. Henry Troost was known for his uh, multiple facades for public buildings, and this is a classic example of it. The only facade on, on the courthouse that didn't have um, these wrought iron lights and they're very similar to what Frank Lloyd Wright would design. He did a lot of ornamental lighting for his buildings um, and that's where the inspiration for these lights came from. But there is none on this west side and that is because that was the original parking lot and loading dock for the courthouse. And that's where the um, ex extension that is now the county offices um, is built in that direction. So what we have here is um, an allusion to actually Native American influence and Spanish w with the um, watchtower on the corner. and. Uh, and then these very interesting side windows. And, and originally, the jail was on the third floor. And, and some disgruntled inmates who were unhappy, very unhappy about something, it might have been the food, um, they stuffed the toilets and overflowed them into the second floor courtroom and did some pretty serious damage to the mural that we'll be looking at later. Um, and then they moved the jail. <laughs> that, and, and if those folks had just been more polite, that's probably one of the neatest floors in the courthouse. It's now for IT, but it, uh, they had a really nice view. <laughs> and they gave all that up. So what you're looking at, and this platform here was not there originally. That's been added to um, uh, function as a stage in a performance area. But there were steps that came down, um, and none of the, the gates were here. It was far more open. And Truth's intention was to um, have a, a not, uh, no obstructions, no buildings or anything surrounding his courthouse so that there, there, you had access to a, a view of it from all sides. But over time, things change and um, 
and the plaza I'm sure a lot of people enjoy having it here but it was not intended to be here and some of you have been around long enough to remember what was here and and on the other side too there were some really neat older buildings and small homes and a small um, shopping plaza and of course all that was removed yeah It will, we're going to go there next. Okay. That's next, Martin. Where do you want them to stand to see this side? Um, we're going to go closer to the building itself, and then we'll back off into the parking lot. But there's the cornerstone. <clears throat> And it says that it was dedicated in 38. And, and you can imagine the size of this courthouse. It wasn't built in a year. It probably was begun maybe four years earlier. I don't have any information on when it was started, but we do know when it was dedicated. And I'm also fairly certain that there were no, was no vegetation up close to the courthouse either. Um, these are probably... Do you want to say, say that from here so they can all see? Okay. You can go up on the stage. <laughs> here are more of these um, wrought iron lamps. And this is another clue that these the three facades were meant to be unified and the the exterior lights helped to indicate that for a long time people assumed that the south wall which we will look at here in just a few moments was um, the was a loading area into the courthouse and it never was. Well, you don't put fancy lights if you're <laughs> using it as a, you know, the back door. And it wasn't the back door. Um, but if you look at what I think is kind of curious is how uh, elongated this entry is. Um, it, it is certainly inspired by Spanish architecture and and again these three facades all reflect the three major cultures of the southwest the native american culture the spanish influence and then the anglo influence so let's back up but watch where you're walking and um we'll take a long view of this <laughs> east facade <laughs> And you can see what I mean about the, the tremendous elongation and, 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 and the pillars that seem almost like they're stretched. Um, but it was uh, in older photographs, those trees weren't there. And they, as beautiful as they are, and who would want to cut a tree down, um, especially out here, uh, they obscure the lines of the the building itself but i think we'll all learn to live with that rather than think that they should be removed but you can see that this is more of a spanish influenced facade um, i'm not quite sure i've never seen an explanation of these indentations above the the window on the right and and its mate that's um, now hidden behind the tree. Um, but someday I may find another building that has similar um, depressions like these. Okay, so now we go to the third facade.
And Troost would have wanted all this not to be a parking lot, but a lawn and um, to isolate and, and be used as a, um, an entrance to the courthouse in the sense that you're approaching a very special building. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a <clears throat> Oh good. We'll get to stand after the <laughs> the vehicle leaves. <laughs> because it's blocking a very unique feature of this south wall. This is, um, looks in many ways to be the most modern of the three facades, but actually there, there's one clue that um, once you see it, you won't forget it, and also it points to an earlier um, architectural style that comes out of the Southwest. And that's Nate, Anasazi, Native Americans. Take a look at the way that the keystone doorway is constructed. <laughs> it's, you can see that at Chaco Canyon. <laughs> I don't know if they heard that on this side. Okay, well come look here so, and I'll say it again. Yeah, so this is the south facade and, and it's directly opposite the um, north facade and entering in the raised area of the, um, the first floor office area. And remember, this was the functioning courthouse and now the new addition has um, assumed all that function, the clerk and the treasurer. And, and it's wonderful when we come through to look at that, and we're gonna have to go around to get in. Um, this came very close to disappearing and getting painted over. And, and we can thank Jackie Catano for saving the day because they were gonna paint the murals over and, and all the signs above each of the large rooms like um, uh, assessor, assessor treasurer, treasurer and, and make them white. <laughs> and, and Jackie um, got it stopped and it, 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 but it was very close to losing part of the, the the um, historic nature of that building. And, uh, and you can sometimes remove paint to watch what's underneath, underneath it, it, but, but not, not without, without damage. damage. So, so we were lucky. Uh, I just asked something, something about us. Besides, besides murals, murals in the courtroom, when when I, I, I worked, worked here in the uh, uh, early, early 70s, 70s for the county, county agent, agent, and we, we were in the basement, basement. Mm -hmm. and at one hand they were there was a jail up on the top, the top floor, and we had a chance to go up there and look at that, and paintings were beautiful. I guess the prisoners, in their free time, the walls inside of the, the cells, the, the paintings were just beautiful. And I just wonder if they, that's no longer a jail, but is that, is that unoccupied or anything like that? Doug, you could answer that question better than me. chambers and the administrative offices for the county commission and all of that was gone the the what you see of the jail are the windows with the small bars and then there is still the jail the barred covered skylight that is still existent hmm. but other than that it's all been reworked to be administrative offences i was just curious i thought maybe it still existed they were, they were beautiful painting for somebody well, there's there's some more now at the at the jail. There's prisoners that have painted murals there. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, 
you see that this is a much simpler architectural style, little ornamentation. Um, it, its main focal point is the door and the, the um, keyhole shape of the door, which is inspired by um, local architecture. Okay, so this is the courthouse, and now we'll walk around and go up to the courtroom. This is the McKinley County Courthouse um, part of the WPA collection. And the originally, and this is something I, that I don't think very many people know, the collection was at one time united. And then in the 60s, not the 30s, in the 60s, it was dispersed amongst civic buildings. The city got some, Red Rock State Park got some, the county did, and the library. And what is really unfortunate about that is that the true story of our WPA collection is only told if all the images are together and ideally housed in the building that was built at the same time. It just makes sense rather than have it dispersed because you get a feeling for how artists were thinking at the time and uh, what inspired them. And, and actually, the federal government, although at first um, they were only purchasing art from established artists all on the East Coast, and then as the um, WPA and the New Deal evolved over time, um, a new thought came, and that was to create a truly American art form, something that was not totally inspired by European thinking or training, but rather was coming from this country itself, unique and exceptional. And, um, and you can begin to see that happening if you look at the images that are on these walls, and then when we look at the, um, the big mural in our courtroom. Did you tell them these are all Lloyd Moylan in yeah. this room? So Lloyd Moylan painted the mural. I think everyone's excited to see it. Yes, I'm so sure we these, are. So notice these, and then we'll go in here. <laughs> okay, and these are all Moylan's. You can see his color work, and which was inspired by the time he spent in Mexico um, working with um, Diego Rivera. And usually the muralists, the big three that most everyone knows uh, David Sequeiros and um, Orozco, Oroz, uh, you say it, Orozco, Orozco. <laughs> and, and Diego Rivera were, um, they worked large and often they would have um, others helping them on their murals and uh, that is where Moylan first got his inspiration for using vivid color and, um, but he also was, um, he felt that artists should not be um, tethered to a style of painting. And you can see a lot of variation in his work. And some artists usually want to be identified by being um, attached to a, a way of painting or drawing, and, but Sequeiros or not Sequeiros, Moylan uh, didn't follow that route. So let's come into the courtroom. Ah, yeah, it'll work. So all of us have spent some time in here. I'm, <laughs> I have spent four jury duty assignments in here, so I got to look at this a lot. <laughs> and, it was the high form of jury yeah. duty. Well, actually, it was for me. 
Are you guys are gonna go around, yeah. right? Okay. So once everyone's in, we're gonna start looking at the mural starts in the main corner. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> we're on <at> twenty feet. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes around clockwise. So this, you can you position yourself so you can see it around around the room, but starting over. Moylan's title for this mural is a clue to how to read it. And, and, and art, especially something on this grand scale, is meant to be read. I mean, it's a visual language. And, um, and he, when you really begin to study it, you can um, clearly understand how um, unique this mural is. So its original title is Allegory, um, A History of the Region. And it does begin here, and it's chrono chronological. But also, one thing that Martin and I discovered when we were recently spending some time in here is that uh, a lot of the symbols that um, all of us who live in the Southwest and are interested in its culture and its inspirations, um, there are some things that precede their chronological introduction. And we finally figured out that's one of the ways that the sequence is established. Um, and I'll show you some examples of this. And yes, the pointer works. Um, this is prehistory. Man hasn't arrived yet, but other things have, like um, wildlife and um, things that crawl on the ground. <laughs> we have plenty of those. And also, there is a motif that appears frequently in Moylan's work, and you saw it if you looked at the um, lithographs in the area outside the courtroom, and that is the appearance of birds. And in this corner, which is the prehistory, pre-Columbian um, phase of the region, there is a bird flying above the window. Yeah, there, <laughs> see it? <laughs> okay, you, you hold the, the <laughs> you be the so pointer. Yes, and um, so you can begin to figure out what, what the um, images are about and when Martin adds to it, this will really come to life. Another unique feature of this mural and in just something I read about Moylan, um, okay, I read about Moylan recently is that uh, he, he blended the, the painting and the architecture, especially in this room. And you can see like these um, supports that hold up the master beams that go across the courtroom. They, and it's called trompe l'oeil, a uh, French term for trick the eye. And you see that the, the architectural elements are, are melded together there. You see it again on this east wall. Um, it's a, an interesting technique to, to not tra treat um, the, the events, the story this mural is telling. It, it helps to tie it together. And, and Martin will spend more time on um, how the allegory fits this whole image and, and ties it together. So now, in terms of composition, you can see how Moylan uses unoccupied white space to um, dynamically tie in the, the sequences of this history of the region. And, and it, uh, he's done other murals in other l buildings in New Mexico in which they're um, brightly 
colored and uh, very vivid and, and active. And this is quite a departure from the way a lot of his work looks. And you can tell by the paintings the difference in um, using a vivid palette that came from his experience with the Mexican muralists. And this, which is inspired by um, other artists, that, and I'm going to point to Europe, Cezanne and Picasso, you can see their inspiration in, in these figures. Um, and you can also see that he, there is, <laughs> there is some color in this mural and, and very limited. The flag <laughs> is painted and, and also the church. And, and this isn't an accident. This would have some meaning drawing your eye to those images. Here, it, you also see the pyramidal composition that is a stable, um, well, configuration, I guess is the best word. And, and he repeats this frequently in the, in the, um, the way he forms um, associations and activities. And then you're moving chronologically again. Um, you can pretty much see how he approaches to the, the modern era, to um, the 19th century, also using these four spaces between the windows, almost like um, the, the Greeks did with some of their um, temple pillars and converting them into figures. And in a way, there is an allusion to that with these. A couple of things that I would also like to mention about uh, Floyd uh, is that when he was <coughs> commissioned to do the mural, his, his history, his knowledge of the history of New Mexico uh, was very good, uh, considering from that time period, uh, 1940. Um, but I think in transposing that state history to what happened in the Gallup area, uh, <clears throat> he used an artist's uh, license, license uh, <laughs> where he could put something in front of something else and that and nobody would really probably know the difference since he didn't really know the difference. You also got to realize that this is in 1940. Uh, World War II had already started in Europe in 1939 with the idea that eventually we're going to be a, maybe a part of that. And so uh, skirmishes, hostility, killing Indians, Indians killing white people. Uh, I'm surprised in a sense that he expanded it as, as much as he did, but there are some situations where historically he kind of got out of, got it out of the, uh, <coughs> the, way, it, the way it really did happen. Uh, for instance, and, and this is, uh, again, artist license. The first panel over in this area here is to depict the variety of lifestyle uh, in animals and environment prior to man. And so not only do you see saber-toothed tigers and things from the Pleistocene, but you also see uh, dinosaurs from the Jurassic and uh, uh, a wide variety of animals, more than plants, but to recognize the fact that there was a, uh, a, a big diversity of, of animal life before man came into the picture and tried to even change it uh, more so. <coughs> when we get over to the <coughs> early hunters and gatherers, 
Um, they're they're doing their thing. There is a <coughs> for some reason uh, even a funeral a uh, burial, and you've got a body wrapped up in a shroud. All these uh, family or whatever. Uh, <coughs> showing uh, remorse and, and the fact that they've lost them. But to an anthropologist, an archaeologist, whenever you see in a culture <coughs> the, the fact that people believe in an afterlife shows the beginnings of religion as a, and spirituality as a part <coughs> of their society. <clears throat> and so I think this is kind of what he was uh, implying here. And then he's also getting into the fact that about, it wasn't a certain time, but it's about 3,000 years ago, uh, the people in this region learned the concepts and the technology of agriculture. Uh, corn was introduced first, followed quickly by beans and squash and melons. And so uh, he's portraying a number of building pottery, uh, planting corn, building the more stable houses, not just a, a, a teepee or a, a, a grass uh, shack, but I think in terms, thinking in terms of, of charcoal. So they're cutting stones, they're, he's even got them making adobe bricks, but both men and women uh, creating and stuccoing uh, the, the larger doors, uh, doorways and walls and, and five-story buildings as it would amount to, as, as, uh, as farmers and agriculturalists and also up in the uh, uh, upper parts that were corn particularly is a very, not only the, the plant that they can survive on but also in a sense a plant from the holy people that corn is uh, an interesting plant it's always been in North America and eventually it came from South America but it's the only completely domesticated plant in the world, not just here, but in the world, where it can't grow unless somebody plants it. It doesn't grow on its own. And so that, that reciprocal uh, <coughs> uh, relationship where I will plant and nourish you, but when you mature, then your products, your corn, then will nourish me. And so there's that relationship uh, uh, with corn that you don't really get with many other, other plants. Then you've got visitors coming into the picture. Athabascan migration, technically <clears throat> Athabascans from Canada are all Apachean or the Zuni word Apache, which means enemy or stranger. One of those groups of Apachean invaders or migrants into this area uh, <clears throat> actually used uh, or have the name today a people of the great planted fields because they're the only Apachean group who took up agriculture. And uh, that's the Navajo. Navajo is a kerosene word for people of the great planted fields. But they were also raiders and uh, along with their Apache cousins. And I, he depicts them here, but they were also Apaches, other Apache groups besides the Navajos giving the Pueblos a very hard time. So you see uh, a lot of vignettes, the, again, the kind of the, the symbols of, 
of what Chaco would be with the multi-storied buildings, but then the, the raids. Uh, he introduces jewelry at a much earlier time period than it was really uh, would have been available, uh, silver bracelets and this sort of thing. But uh, that's, again, art artistic license. Uh, for a Navajo warrior to walk off, to run off with the, the mother, the female Pueblo, with a little kid saying goodbye to mother and a dead father. And then, uh, and then the other thing that is just as important, run off with the corn uh, that they had just uh, harvested. Then we get into this whole section of the wall dealing with the Spanish in Toronto. Historically, the <clears throat> a very first uh, group of Spaniards that, that came into, they were uh, marooned from uh, uh, boat, uh, uh, Shipwreck. Uh, 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 a, uh, <coughs> in Florida, a, a, a tornado. Uh, Hurricane, hurricane, yeah. Of the four survivors, one was the slave of one of the other survivors. His name was Estevan or Estevanito. Uh, he really only played a minor part, but to the artist, he wanted to emphasize the fact that there was a black person that did play a part. So it gave him, I think, a lot more space in the mural than he probably deserved. And it, and it was way at the very, very beginning. Uh, when they finally arrived back in Mexico with all sorts of stories about uh, wealth <coughs> and uh, wealthy uh, Pueblos and, and up in an area named Cibola. Uh, a priest with Estevan coming back then as a guide uh, came up into the area that we refer to today as Zuni. Zuni is one of the six cities of Cibola. The Spaniards uh, uh, were thinking that maybe this had something to do with an earlier folk tale of the seven cities of Antilla, uh, and it didn't. Uh, there was only six, but that didn't bother them. Uh, Estevan <coughs> kind of let his position go to his head or go to his groin or combination of both. And um, there are several reasons given in, in folklore why the Zunis killed him and then uh, cut him up into six pieces and all six villages still have a piece of Estevan today, 300 years later. But as a result of that expedition by Fray Marcus Denizas, uh, the major uh, movement under Coronado then took place in 1540 to 1542. And, but that's shown more over uh, to the left. I think, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, using some of the actual f structures uh, within this room to highlight or to uh, bring in uh, some of these uh, things that he wanted to talk about or, or, or uh, explain or, or emphasize. And you can see the Zuni warrior behind him with the knife. Uh, he's uh, not, uh, and then the coming of Christianity. Then you got your Hispanic period coming over the, the uh, <clears throat> Uh, the time period when there was the Pueblo Revolt, and, uh, and really that isn't really showing that much. What he picks up on then is that by the, 
uh, the Spanish revolt against the Pueblos, the return of the Spanish uh, in 1692, and the little better relationship between the Spanish and the Pueblos, and the, uh, and the uh, intervention of the uh, Athabascans, and when you get into the 1840s, we realize that uh, uh, well, historically, the United States, uh, in a pretense, and first of all, to get Texas away from Mexico after the Alamo and all of that. But while they're doing it, they declare war on Mexico in general and, and don't stop until they capture Mexico City. Again, the Marine Corps uh, song from the halls of Montezuma imply, uh, is a reference to when the Marines were down in Mexico City. When, that, when the smoke was over with and the fighting was over with, one third of that nation of Mexico was ceded to the United States. And so Texas, what was New Mexico and Arizona, Southern Colorado, Southern Utah, all of Nevada and all of California, that was part of Mexico, now becomes part of the United States. I think with the, uh, that idea and also the fact that we're being a little kind of patriotic with World War II just across the ocean. We haven't gotten involved in it yet, but there might be a time, and there was, December 7th in 41. He made a point that when the Americans came here in 1840, uh, again, 45 and 46, the only time in this entire mural where he used a bright blue and red uh, paint is when he painted the American flag. So it stands out as kind of a centerpiece before the United States and after the United States uh, with that one episode of, of soldiers, cavalry coming in with the flag. So the uh, the fighting now becomes a part uh, where the U.S. government uh, plays a much more important role. With Navajos killing Hispanics and Anglos, uh, as you can see in this over-the-door uh, situation, uh, minus the, the necklace that really wasn't there, that uh, wasn't coming in that at that point in time. You have the Navajos finally subdued. It's kind of a reference to Fort Sumner and the Bosque Redondo and the Long Walk. But uh, all you really see of it in, in terms of allegory is a group of Navajo, mostly women, very sorrowful, the kids sitting there <coughs> and a sheep with an arrow in it <coughs> and guarded by U.S. soldiers of a Civil War time uh, or period uniforms. There is nothing in this mural that depicts the Navajos coming back except that all of a sudden they're, they're back and they're learning silversmithing, they're doing weaving, they're doing something besides raiding and, and killing and and that sort of thing. And then it dawns on him that, you know, Zuni is a part of McKinley County also, and they have their history. And so all of a sudden, here is Shalico and some dancers. And uh, again, just a reminder that Zuni is also a part uh, of McKinley County. Uh, not much, but at least he, he shows it. Also during, since uh, the Civil War is over with, 
<coughs> you've got uh, uh, miners especially. They've already pretty well come even before the Civil War. The 49ers were through this area and in 1849. That's uh, 10 years before the Civil War, uh, or uh, 49, 59, 60, so. But <clears throat> those people made a presence in this area. So you see miners and fur trappers and even uh, coal miners uh, to, to an extent, but you see a, a couple of beaver way up on the top, and they're the ones that are getting, getting chased uh, to realize that there were beaver in this area till, till they were all uh, hunted out by, by the uh, fur trappers. In the center area, there's still the fur trapper concept and foxes and, and uh, raccoons, rabbits, where, what kind of food or what kind of plant, uh, animals that you're doing for, uh, for, for food or for commerce. I think the Navajo woman with uh, kind of reclining and watching her children, taking care of the sheep. Interestingly enough, except for the dead sheep over here, the only other time when he actually portrayed uh, sheep as being a, uh, an integral part of McKinley County. And uh, the Navajo man, I don't know if he's asleep or, uh, uh, but he's also in a very restful position. You have then the coming of the stagecoaches, the beginning of, of uh, white people more or less into this region, and a, a, a uh, <coughs> trader uh, negotiating with the woman, and that was more often than not, it was the woman with her rugs, and that sort of thing that did the, the negotiating with the, uh, with the trading post. The wagons, and then eventually uh, the railroad itself. And to him, uh, with the coming of the railroad and the trading posts and the mining, uh, pretty well culminated uh, what he had wanted to portray with regard to McKinley, Mount, McKinley, McKinley County. In the four panels, I, I find it kind of interesting. This one is supposed to be a cowboy that is still looking for some cattle someplace, either down around Fence Lake or <coughs> maybe up in this area, and he's rolling his cigarette. I find the rendition of a tourist with the camera uh, interesting because the tourist hat has a swastika on it. Now the swastika uh, from our feelings in this area are, is a Native American uh, symbol. But to paint it in 1940, when Hitler is doing his thing in Europe, and the swastika has a very definite role with Nazism, uh, I I think, I don't know if that's maybe a German tourist that's here or not, but I, I find it kind of interesting that he, he brought that question out. Uh, in this one, well, it's an archaeologist. And most people are wondering why, why is the archaeologist sitting there with a log? Well, he's doing something that in 1940, was a very, very recent technical advancement in archaeology. And that's dendrochronology, or counting the tree rings and logs that were used to, uh, for, in uh, Hogan's, in Chaco Canyon, and any place uh, where wood was still av available to the archaeologist, <clears throat> we could tell when that tree was born, 
and the outer rim, or ring when that tree was cut. And so dating uh, places like Chaco, dating Hogans, dating other uh, archaeological sites became much more efficient with the whole concept of dendrochronology. And that's what he's got that guy doing, counting the rings uh, in, a, in a roll. Uh, and then probably uh, uh, giving uh, uh, a final uh, salute to the magnificent culture that existed at uh, Chaco Canyon for 400 years or so, uh, back a thousand years. <clears throat> but that pretty well brings us around. Because uh, he had a time, as Caroline might have mentioned too, he chose to only use a, a couple paints. Uh, <coughs> kind of a reddish brown, a bluish gray, a green, uh, kind of an off green, a black that outlined many of these figures, <coughs> and then one exception, the American flag. But I, I think he had a, he was making a point when he did that again in, in 1940. So, it's an interesting mural. The, the, she mentioned there were times when people here in the, in the administration wanted to paint over it. Uh, it's been restored here about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but it's a, it's a method of, uh, of that is very common to, uh, to Floyd and uh, or to Lloyd, and, and I, except for the fact of getting some of these positions out of historical c sequence, uh, there's noth nothing really tremendously historically wrong with the figures or with their costumes or anything, if you look at them a little w without trying to get get them into perfect. Uh, time uh, uh, chron chronology. Uh, that. Well, we can forgive him because it's 2,000 square feet, so. <laughs> he did a good job. And we have a working theory, or at least I do, that um, Lloyd Moylan maybe chose a muted color palette when he wanted to play more with composition. You can see some of that outside, which I'm happy to tell you about a little bit more, but we're right up against the time.